Hey everyone, ready for a deep dive? We're tackling a muscle disease in Dutch Quaker dogs that's got everyone talking. Polymyositis. It's a fascinating case, really gets into the nitty gritty of what happens at a cellular level. And you know me, I love getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah especially when the research is as in-depth as what you sent over. It's not just about identifying the disease, though, is it? This research could have much broader implications, maybe even helping us understand similar conditions in humans. Now, that's what I call a win-win. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start with the basics. We're talking about Dutch Kukers here, a breed with a pretty unique history. Absolutely. They were almost completely wiped out after World War II, you know? Yeah, I'd heard that. It's amazing they were able to bring them back from the brink like that. It was a close call. They managed to revive the breed from a very small number of dogs, but that kind of genetic bottleneck can have its downsides. Like making certain inherited diseases more common. Exactly. And that brings us to polymyositis, or PM for short. So for those of us who don't have a veterinary dictionary on hand, what exactly is PM? What's happening in the muscles of these dogs? In the simplest terms, it's an immune-mediated disease. The body's own defense system gets a bit confused and starts attacking the muscles as if they were a threat. The poor muscles. So what kind of symptoms do we see in Kukers with PM? Well, because it affects the muscles, you see things like difficulty walking, muscle weakness, even problems swallowing. It's not pretty, especially for a breed as active as Kukers. Makes you realize how debilitating muscle diseases can be. Yeah. So how did the researchers tackle this problem? What was their approach to understanding PM in Kukers? They got their hands dirty, that's for sure. They analyzed muscle biopsies from 39 Kukers diagnosed with PM, and they didn't hold back on the analysis. It sounds intense. I'm guessing they weren't just looking at these biopsies under a regular when microscope. You, no, they went all out. Yeah. Microscopic analysis, immunophenotyping, the whole shebang. Let's talk about thorough. I have to admit, though, all those technical terms make my head spin a bit. What were they hoping to find by looking at the biopsies in such detail? Well, they were essentially trying to identify the culprits, the key players in this whole muscle mystery. And one of the first things they found was a significant infiltration of CD3 plus T cells in the affected muscles. CD3 plus T cells. Remind me again what those are. Sure. T cells are a type of white blood cell, part of the immune system's rapid response team. They're usually the good guys, fighting off infections and keeping things in check. So why are they causing problems in these dogs? That's the million dollar question. In PM, these CD3 plus T cells, particularly a subset called CD8 plus T cells, seem to be mistakenly attacking healthy muscle fibers. So it's like they've gone rogue, decided the muscles are the enemy. Exactly. And here's where it gets even more intriguing. They also discovered that the muscle fibers of these kookers were expressing something called MHC2. MHCD2. Now that's a new one for me. Break it down for us. What is that and why is it significant? MHC stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. Think of them like little identification tags on the surface of cells. So the cells are basically saying, hey, this is who I am, don't mind me. Right. They display bits of what's happening inside the cell, allowing the immune system to monitor for anything suspicious. A sort of cellular security system. Exactly. Healthy cells typically don't express MHC live on their surface, but in these cookers with PM, the muscle fibers were waving that MHC2 flag like crazy. Hmm. So it's almost like they were drawing attention to themselves, making those rogue T cells even more likely to attack. Now you're getting it. And that's what makes this finding so significant. It suggests that the muscle cells might be playing a more active role in their own demise than we previously thought. That's a game changer. But is it the muscle cells themselves causing the problem, or are they reacting to something else? Is this a case of mistaken identity on the part of the T cells, or something more? That, my friend, is the question of the hour. And it's one we'll be digging into as we continue our deep dive. So we've got these confused... CD8 plus T cells on a rampage, but it sounds like they've got some accomplices. Oh, absolutely. It's never just one type of cell causing all the trouble, is it? It's like a whole immune system party in there, and nobody told the muscles. A, a pretty wild party from the looks of it. The researchers found macrophages, B cells, the whole inflammatory gang was present. It really highlights the complexity of these immune responses. It does make you realize it's not as simple as we sometimes make it out to be. But before we get too lost in the cellular weeds, I wanted to zoom out for a second. We're talking about cuckoos here, but we know PM affects other breeds too. Right, like Hungarian Vizlas, for example. Exactly. So how does what we're seeing in cuckoos compare to PM in other breeds? Are there any key differences? 
One of the interesting things about PM and Krukers is that it doesn't seem to target specific muscle groups. In Vizlas, for instance, we often see certain muscles being more affected than others. That's fascinating. You'd almost expect to see some patterns, wouldn't you? You would, but this study suggests that PM in Krukers might have a more generalized presentation. Interesting. Now, I know some of the Krukers in this study had difficulty swallowing, which made me think of masticatory muscle myositis, or MMM. Ah, yes. MMM, another muscle disease that can cause big problems. Exactly. So did the researchers find any connection between PM and MMM in these dogs? It's a good question, especially with those dysphagia symptoms. But surprisingly, they didn't find a strong link to MMM in the clickers. Really? So even though both PM and MMM can cause swallowing problems, they might be distinct entities in cookers. That seems to be the case, at least based on this research. They even examined biopsies from the masticatory muscles, the ones involved in chewing in six of the dogs, and found no inflammation in those specific muscles. Wow. So even though the symptoms might overlap, the underlying cause could be totally different. It really makes you appreciate the complexity of these diseases. Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. a good reminder that we can't always rely on symptoms alone to tell us what's going on. We have to dig deeper, look at the bigger picture. Now, speaking of digging deeper, we can't talk about PM without mentioning genetics. What role do genes play in all of this and how does it differ between breeds? You're right, genetics are a huge piece of the puzzle. We know from studying Vizlas that a specific MHC2C haplotype is linked to an increased risk of developing PM. MHC2, those cellular ID tags we were talking about earlier. The very same. So in Vizlas, having this particular haplotype is like having a genetic red flag. But not a guaranteed diagnosis. For exactly. It. it just means those dogs might be more susceptible to developing PM, but it's not a foregone conclusion. So genes aren't destiny. There's obviously more to the story. Precisely. Environmental factors, other triggers, they all likely play a role. It's that complex interplay between nature and nurture again. Exactly. And speaking of genetic links, there was a fascinating study recently on another Dutch breed, Dutch Shepherd dogs, that I think is worth mentioning. Oh, yeah, I read about that. They found a genetic mutation that could be directly causing PM in that breed, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one. And here's where it gets really interesting. The mutation they found affects the mitochondria. Mitochondria the powerhouses of the cell. You got it. They're responsible for producing energy, which, as you can imagine, is pretty important for muscles. Muscles are energy hogs. So if this mutation is messing with the mitochondria, it makes sense that those muscle cells might be more vulnerable to damage. It's like having a faulty engine in a car. It might run for a while, but eventually it's going to give out. So in Dutch Shepherd dogs, this mutation might be the primary driver of PM. But in Quakers, it sounds like we're still trying to crack the genetic code. Precisely. It highlights the fact that PM isn't a one-size-fits-all disease. There might be multiple pathways that lead to the same outcome. So just because two breeds have PM doesn't mean it's caused by the same thing. That's a crucial takeaway for vets, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. We can't assume that what we see in one breed will hold true for another, even if the symptoms look similar on the surface. It's all about personalized medicine tailoring our approach based on each breed's unique genetic makeup and potential risk factors. It's like having a key that opens multiple doors, but finding the right door for that key is the tricky part. A great analogy. It really underscores the need for personalized medicine in veterinary care. Now, going back to the Quaker study, did you notice how much detail they included about the muscle biopsies themselves? Oh, yeah. They didn't just stop at identifying which immune cells were involved. They went deeper, wanted to see the actual damage these cells were causing to the muscle tissue. Exactly. And what they found was pretty amazing. They saw all these muscle fibers that should be nice and uniform, but instead they're all different sizes and shapes. Some of them are shrunken, atrophied, while others are actually enlarged, like they're trying to compensate for their weaker neighbors. So it's this chaotic mix of damaged and overworked muscle fibers. Exactly. And as if that wasn't enough, they also found evidence of fibrosis and lipomatosis in the muscle tissue. Okay, now you're just using big words to make me feel like I skipped vet school. What are those? Mm. Sorry. Basically, it means that as the inflammation continues, Continues, these other tissues, fibrosis and lipomatosis, start to replace the healthy muscle tissue, making the muscles even weaker. It's like the damage just keeps piling on. So it's this vicious cycle of inflammation, damage, and then more loss of muscle function. Not a good situation for these dogs. 
Unfortunately, that's a common theme with chronic inflammatory diseases. However, and this is a big however, despite all the damage, the researchers also found evidence of muscle regeneration. Wait, really? That's amazing. So even with all the inflammation and damage, the muscles are trying to heal themselves. That's right. They found newly formed muscle fibers, a sure sign that the regeneration process was happening. That's incredible. So even though the immune system is basically attacking the muscles, the muscles are fighting back. Makes you wonder if there's a way to boost that regeneration process, give those muscles a fighting chance. That's the crux of the matter, isn't it? And that's why research like this is so important. The more we understand about this complex dance between inflammation, damage, and regeneration, the better equipped we'll be to develop targeted treatments that can help these dogs. This deep dive has been quite the journey. We've gone from rogue T-cells attacking muscle fibers to the genetic underpinnings of PM, and we even touched on the body's remarkable ability to heal itself. It's amazing how much we're learning about this disease. It really is, and it highlights the power of scientific inquiry to help us unravel these medical mysteries one study at a time. Well said. Uh. From Vet Neurojar, keep those minds inspired, hearts light, and tails wagging.